and how we define what is good, not only what is right and capable. We can also utilize neuroscience and technology to augment the capability of potential war fighters, not just intelligence operators. This sort of gets into some of the discourse that had been bantered around previously in the field with regard to, quote, super soldiers, and what we're able to do with regard to capabilizing functions of the brain to then increase our cognition, our emotions, and our behaviors in a variety of warfighting type tasks. Can you do this? Well, this is the area of neuroenablement. Yes, of course you can, within certain parameters. And like so many other things, it's less than ideal and less than complete. But can we target key neurological substrates change the function of those substrates, and in so doing, approach various trajectories of improving individuals' cognitive skills on key tasks, emotional capabilities in the key circumstances, and behaviors and actions in key performance parameters? Yes, we can. Are there limits? Are there constraints? Yes, absolutely. But how can we do this? Well, I think one of the easiest ways, although not necessarily the most effective, is through the use of advanced neuropharmacological agents. And there are a host of them. Certainly, we hear a lot of the discourse about performance-enhancing drugs, not only in terms of the military, but for a variety of, of other uses, inclusive the civilian side of the house where people are looking to take a variety of drugs, stimulants, eugeroics, uh, vigilance, uh, anti-sedative drugs, to be able to then increase their capability to study, to function, to be better at work, cognitive enhancers. Uh, could these be used within military and security intelligence frameworks? Yes, absolutely we could. Could we also use computational brain machine interfacing? Without a doubt. Could we use closed and open loop brain stimulation approaches, not necessarily through the use of indwelling devices, such as implants, but also perhaps through the use of non-invasive brain stimulation, such as transcranial magnetic and electrical stimulation? The answer appears to be yes. The short answer, the long answer, is that it is exceedingly context dependent it's based upon brain state, based upon task, and we have to define what exact parameters of performance we're looking to affect and what changing the function of nerve and brain does to change the relative outcomes with regard to these performances. But that doesn't mean we can't do it. The question is, should we and how? The same is true with regard to neurosensory augmentation. Here I'll speak very specifically to some of the programs you have ongoing. There have been some bioengineering programs here at this laboratory that has looked at the capability to increase visual acumen, if not restore sight, to individuals who've lost their sight. Increased capability to create second and third generation cochlear and auditory implants. These are not limited to the usual range of the human sensorium, but can, in fact, be used to get increased focus, what's sometimes referred to as eagle eye, or something referred to as bat's ear. So the ability to then extend the sensorium and modify human capability outside what falls within the Gaussian distribution of what is human clearly is capable here and may be paired to other forms of neurological intervention to create open and closed loop brain systems to really expand not only the capacity of the human system within its functional range, but to go beyond that and now have something called exceptional modification. No sci-fi here, folks, only facts. Then we get into the real form of a weapon. And we're talking about a real form of a weapon. Remember, this is a means of contending against another in each and all of these dimensions. Assess and predict their escalations to violence so that we may be able to intervene, perhaps mitigate those. Mitigate said aggression directly or indirectly. Incur certain burdens of morbidity that makes them less likely to engage in combative or violent activity and in some cases, induce mortality. These are all viable operational definitions of a weapon, and can neuroscience and technology be employed for these? Each and all. One of the areas where we're looking to refine the capabilities of neuroscience and technology is something referred to as non-lethal or less lethal weapons. And while one might think that the ethical argument strongly supports these direction, here too, there is, in fact, a strong discourse that pushes back against any potential military or warfare applications of the brain sciences that I think you need to understand. The reason I bring that up is that this can do two things. Number one, it creates a posture where the neurosciences cannot and should not ever be used for these types of operations. Please understand, my feeling on that is, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? If we could, in fact, look ourselves in our eye as humanity and say we shall never employ science and technology for those means that may be destructive against others, irrespective of whether or not those individuals are aligned with our ideology and our beliefs. Yes, that would be. The reality of the situation poses itself as something quite differently, however. 
And the problem we need to face is that certain prohibitions, if not frank proscriptions against using brain science in these potential ways, even defensively, may create an opportunistic window for others to be able to then pursue these approaches more vigilantly and more aggressively. It's a balancing act, folks. I'm not going to necessarily tell you how to resolve it because I don't know, and it becomes difficult. There are certain things we can do on the research side of the house to dial back who does the research, what type of research is done, and what it's used for. But this is a cat that's already out of the bag, and as I hope to demonstrate to you in a moment, this is being conducted on an international scale, and so it may be a little late to start thinking about we're never going to use it like this and what happens if we do or we don't. What types of kind of neuroweapons can we engage and develop? Well, I provide them for you. I don't want to go down into specific granularity as to what each one of them do because I don't want to give you bad dreams, and you're not going to blame me if you wake up in a cold sweat screaming in the middle of the night. But this is what we can do with these things. Again, let's think here about drugs and bugs. 